Hello, hello. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Good afternoon. Can you hear what me? What up, though? Okay. <laughs> Snoop, sound check. Mic check, one, what? two. All right, we're good. By, by, by the way, can you, can you guys turn this clock off right here? Because we've got to go for a while. <laughs> if you don't mind. Much appreciated. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, it's so nice to see the room so full. I'm Shirley Halperin. I'm the executive editor at Variety. Thrilled to have my old pal Larry Jackson here. What's up, Charles? My old pal Snoop Dogg here in the house uh, to talk about their thriving businesses. These guys are, are the goats of their own uh, you know, sectors of the entertainment business, and it's really amazing. It's so impressive. Um, first, I wanted to talk about Gamma and introduce the room to Gamma, oh, okay. Larry Jackson's creation. Um, Larry, if you guys don't know, is the former uh, global creative director at Apple, Apple Music. And he has created this new company that, I'm just going to say, in their own words, offers the world's leading artists creative and business services across all artistic and commercial touch points. And I love this. Gamma provides the resources, capabilities, and experience to help cultural icons develop their business vision and accelerate its execution. Gamma is not a label. No. It is not a management company. It's a connective tissue bridging the gap between enigmatic genius and everyday life. Those are some good words right there. <laughs> yeah, it's a little loquacious. I can maybe go a little more succinctly on that. Gamma, um, you know, it was, it was birthed from my experiences being at Apple, you know? Um, it was birthed from my experiences being at Interscope. Uh, being at RCA Music Group, um, managing. So, you know, I took the best of those experiences and put them in a blender and created this company that, um, you know, quite frankly, the way I see it is actually an enterprise software company, enterprise software tech company for music, as much as it is uh, a content company, um, culture company, and certainly a media company. So, um, yeah, we're not a label, you know? We're, we're operating in that space. But Death Row Records, which Snoop is representing today, head to toe, and you're, you are the, the steward of Death Row now, Snoop. You acquired those rights. That has a home at Gamma, correct? Oh, big home. Um, it was literally the first thing we put out. As a matter of fact, um, you know, shout out to the guys from Eldridge in the room. I just saw Todd Bowley on stage a little while ago, but we were knocking this deal out on Christmas Eve, if you remember Snoop. And one of the things that, that Todd and I um, came up with at the last hour because of just my relationship with Snoop and how much I wanted him to be a part of what we were doing and, and, and wear the jersey as much as we were going to wear his jersey, um, Snoop was a partner in Gamma. Snoop, you know, came into our Series A round and, you know, he's not just an artist whose music we distribute, um, but he's my partner, you know, as much as Eldridge is, as much as Apple is, you know, as much as I've certainly put in capital as well. So. Um, yeah, death row is gamma, you know? Yeah, so Snoop, being where you are in your career, and we're going to just like start in the present, we'll go back. Um, you know, you've been at the top of your game in so many different fields, from recorded music, producing, uh, film. I mean, you know, you're, you're an iconic person. What does gamma bring to you, to your business, to this phase in your professional career? Can y'all raise your glasses up and uh, let's go? <laughs> Toast to that gin and juice they yeah, gave you on the gin house tonight. Here. <laughs> That's how we're gonna start this off. A little something to sip on. Let's go. Somehow they missed mine. What? You had some What's in up? the back. You already had some. Oh, all right, all right. I took care of you already. Okay, pipe down. <laughs> no, what uh, what Gamma provides for me is the opportunity to to grow as an executive and not just be treated as an artist. For many years, I've been the, you know, the front guy, the player, the artist, but now I'm in the part of my career where I wanted to you know, gradually grow into being an executive to try to step into a whole nother realm, and Gamma gives me the opportunity to exercise that by me purchasing Death Row Records and becoming a CEO rather than being an artist. Now I can make different moves, different plays, and I can have the ability to be creative and innovative and, and to go into the future with somebody like Gamma and Larry Jackson, who understands the corporate world, the hood, and the business world that I'm trying to get to. So 
It's just an exciting place to be where I can, where I can actually thrive as an executive rather than, you know, try to keep doing the same things over and over again as an artist. And Shirley, uh, if, I, if, I, if I can interject, I mean, admit the world to me, you know, there's, there's three major labels. There's Universal, Sony, and Warner, of course, right? Snoop could have gone to any three of them, you know, in a very conventional, traditional way and done this deal with them. Um, but the difference of what we have to offer him is actually with the distribution company that I bought, Vidya, um, which is becoming Gamma Distribution, um, Snoop's going to get paid. If Snoop went to one of the other places that I mentioned, he'd be getting paid on a biannual basis, sloppily on a biannual basis. But now we actually have the ability, we have the actual dashboard, uh, financial analytics dashboard, paying Snoop once a month. There's certain artists that are coming through our distribution company that are being paid once a week. You've got to understand how revolutionary this is. This doesn't exist in the music business like this. This is why I've fought so hard to buy a company like Vidya because of the tech stack that they have that almost really makes it like an enterprise software company in that regard. So I'm so proud of that that I really have to underscore that, that paying our artists once a month, uh, and in certain cases, once we can get it down to once a week, is something that's never been seen before in the music business in the modern era. It's true. I mean, good luck getting your money in 18 months, like on the old system, right? right. Um, yeah, and you want to audit, it's like, you know, I lost my bag on British Airways and I'm not going to wait on hold for three hours to try to see what, you know what I mean? It's with that yeah. level of, you know, so we can talk about that another time, but, you know. <laughs> you feel me, Snoop? <laughs> All right, well, uh, speaking as um, Larry, I mean, I think the first black executive to have a company launched with a billion dollars um, in capital and debt, is that, is that correct? Uh, I believe so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, this thing launched, I, I, I still remember our many, many phone calls leading up to the big day. Um, it's only been like six or seven weeks. Like, what have you been doing? Uh, I've been chilling, <laughs> you feel me? Uh, <laughs> Now, we actually just announced an hour ago, literally I was working on the press release before I came up on stage, we just made a major move uh, in Africa and the Middle East. Uh, I'm so proud to welcome to the Gamma team uh, Saipu uh, Delamini, um, who's gonna be joining us as our president of Africa and the Middle East. Um, he was a CEO of Africa, um, Sub-Saharan Africa for UMG, did an incredible job for them, built that territory up. Um, he is the preeminent leader uh, in music in Africa, and he's now our president uh, in Africa in the Middle East for Gamma. And our special advisor, which we also just announced today, uh, is none other than uh, Naomi Campbell, um, who's also gonna lead us in that territory as well. And you know, we just released an album with Rima uh, this past week, which is exclusive to us in Africa. Uh, we're gonna make another big announcement. We signed, I think, the biggest artist ever from Africa, which I'm not going to mention today. Uh, we'll have something separate for that. So we, we, we've been cooking. Wow. And one of the projects that you got out was a 420 collaboration with Snoop. Oh, yeah. Correct? Yeah. So this is kind of amazing. Um, you did 420 pieces of vinyl, collector's edition vinyl. Uh, you put it out on record store day and also coinciding with 420, which is you know, the Stoner International Holiday. Um, it is? Yo, by the way, y'all should have seen that dressing room backstage. Yeah, it is. It is? <laughs> <laughs> it had a large sheet of smokable, rollable paper in the limited it edition did? vinyl. <laughs> No, we want, what we wanted to do was we wanted to do something special on 424. <laughs> the diehard Snoop Dogg fans, Death Row fans, Doggy Style is the 30th anniversary is coming up this year. So, thank you. So we wanted, we wanted to do something that was like a limited edition where it couldn't get to a lot of people and it would be special for those who actually hold it and, you know, it's a collectible. So I wanted to do something like that and Larry was willing to do it at the quickness and we got it done. I mean, brilliant. Larry, you said you guys could have easily sold 50,000 of those, right? Yeah, we dropped it at uh, midnight on 420. Um, you know, and I'm thinking, okay, this is like our first D2C exercise as a company. We, sh we sold it on shop. 
uh, .bgamma.com. We sold that in less than 30 seconds. So Snoop puts a poll up asking how many other people would love to see, you know, us do, uh, do, do further drops. And we, uh, yeah, I think, I think we got like another 50,000 requests. So we could have sold a lot that day, but uh, we actually could have even sold it for more, but did it but for what, the But tell the truth. You, you, you hit me and you was like, should we sell some more? I did. I did. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, cuz. And you was like, let me show you what the people saying. And then the people said, you better not sell no more. We got 420 of these as our collectibles. Don't you sell no more. <laughs> so we had to go with what the people said. The people felt yeah. like it was an exclusive situation for them. So it wasn't about the money. It was about the people. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, exactly. The, ca the, ca the capitalist in me, I must say, at the Milken Conference was ready to, <laughs> you know, stop that shit up. <laughs> <laughs> But this is kind of what you're talking about, about like seeing those revenues quickly. Mm -hmm. Because not only would this be difficult at a major label, just getting in the pipeline, getting the vinyl yeah. made, get, convincing them to only do a certain number. Um, but then it's like, yeah, to collect those royalties is like, that's a long, long wait. So again, yeah. it's yeah. just, it's that's like instant income. That's the key. A lot of these artists, you know, I was one of them. We get to a certain point of our career where we start crying and complaining about not getting royalties, not getting this because we signed a bad contract or this or that. Now you have the opportunity to come into the game with understanding, with business, with full, complete knowledge of what to and what not to do. Not like how we were done and how the industry programs you to not have information. We're trying to reprogram you to have information on the introduction rather than when you're 60 or 70 years old and you're trying to figure it out. We want you to figure it out from That's the right. intro. Yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, speaking of doggy style, uh, it was just announced, I think, yesterday. Doggy style? You're so nasty. <laughs> Stop it. <laughs> it was announced just yesterday that you're doing <laughs> a 30th anniversary concert, series of concerts, yeah. at the Hollywood Bowl yes. next month. I mean, can you tell our very exclusive audience a little something about what that's going to be like? Who's going to be involved? Yes, it's going to be with a 60-piece orchestra. It's going to be produced by Dr. Dre. It's going to be a great night. It's from the Super Bowl to the Hollywood Bowl. Okay. You know, in the Super Bowl, we had 12 minutes to actually give you a great show. The Hollywood Bowl, I'm gonna give you about 65, 70 minutes. So, if I were you, I would buy my tickets now because I'm not giving none away. Don't call me, don't ask me. <laughs> So hurry up and get a ticket before it's gone. <laughs> That's amazing. Have you always wanted to do like a collab with an orchestra? I mean, this is the L.A. Phil that's I've always that's felt like my music was theatrical. Mm. I felt like people could see my music, they could feel my music, and sometimes a video wouldn't give you a full picture or an understanding of what this music was. And through performances and watching amazing performances from hip-hop artists and watching great performances in Vegas and just all over the world, I always wanted to have something that could represent me theatrically on stage. And I feel like this is a piece of it, a portion of it with an orchestra, with the sonics and the sounds and the, and the, the lights and the cameras and the actions and just the way my songs make you feel and the way that I'll be able to project them. I'll give you a story. I went to a, a Hollywood Bowl show before because I had lost a contest with a, a girl I was working out in the gym with. She was saying that if she lose more weight or if I gain more weight, the loser got to take somebody to a date. So I lost a date, so we had to go to the Hollywood Bowl to see a symphony. I'm like, I don't want to see this shit. So I go, <laughs> and I'm sitting there with her, and we watching the show, and they doing the music, ain't nobody singing. And I'm looking at her, and she crying and shit. I'm like, what the fuck is going on? She like, this is the part where he kills his father. I'm like, he, they ain't even saying no words. <laughs> but just watching how she was so in tune with the, the <laughs> orchestra and the sounds and all that shit, I was like, damn. I wonder if I did my music up here, would people feel like this? To have like the, and all of the shit that come with it. 
<laughs> because it's actually in my music. Like, if you listen to the music, it's already in there. It's just never been produced like that. And that's the thrill for me and Dr. Dre to give you guys, like, something that you've never seen from us. And it's been 30 years since Doggy Style, so we just want to present it to Hollywood Bowl in a real way. I can't wait to go. I will buy my tickets. I won't ask, <laughs> I promise. Um, you know, hearing you describe the theatricality of music, of your music, it makes me think about all these other careers that you have now, Snoop. Like, uh, you are uh, making a movie, right, uh, called Underdogs? Yeah, yeah, football movie. Football movie with MGM mm -hmm. and Amazon. Mm -hmm. um, it's coming out in the fall. You also have a biopic in the works, is that correct? Yes, I have a biopic that I'm working on based on my life and the, you know, the whole makings of Snoop Dogg, because a lot of times you just see it and don't understand what, what it took to become it. And I wanted to present it with a real movie company. Universal Pictures is doing it. So we slated to get it rocking and rolling after this strike, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Right, that's right. I mean, so Larry, are you involved in these, in, in sort of, uh, I don't know, elevating or amplifying Any, any, anything these, these projects? Def, anything Death Row Records Larry is involved with. That's we, that. We're a partnership. We, Got it. All things Death Row Records. Some of these things were worked on before me and him did the deal, but he was always a part of the team. And once we did the deal, it just solidified that I got a partner who would understand where we want to go with this. Got it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Yeah. Um, love that. And is there any unscripted stuff in the works, too? Um, like on the reality front, or? Yeah. There is? Okay. <laughs> is that still top secret? Sorry, my bad. Yeah, the, the strike going on, I might be able to get some more money right now. Let, <laughs> <laughs> let me position this real quick. Yeah. <laughs> what else are you thinking? What other projects do you have, you um, know, marinating? I see Chris Tucker in the house. We got this. <laughs> Smokey. <laughs> I always said Chris played me and Friday. I felt like Smokey was me in real life. <laughs> well, Larry, you do have deals with other artists, celebrities, personalities. Yeah. You mentioned Naomi Campbell. Um, Rick Ross mm -hmm. is one of them. Usher yep. and L.A. Reid. Yep. A combination, and perhaps you'd like to reveal a certain African Moroccan <laughs> rapper who has also been added to your stable. Uh, yeah, pretty soon though, pretty soon. <laughs> oh, oh, we're, oh, that's what we're doing? Uh, yeah, I'm, just, I'm just looking at my investors in the crowd right now, so I'm just okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's just say the roster is growing. Yeah, yeah the roster is growing. <laughs> um, I did want to ask you, like, how do you see distribution in this day and age? You know, mm. we're the music industry is in a really great place. It was a yeah. $16 billion business last year. 26, actually. It's the biggest well, year that, of revenue. Uh, sorry, in the yeah. U.S. and then yeah, 26 yeah, definitely, global definitely. Um, sure. per the RIAA yep. uh, and IFPI. So, yeah, how do you see distribution in this era of streaming and virality and TikTok and all those things? I mean, I, I, I see it as, as the most exciting time that I've ever been in the music business. Um, you know, just the democratization of it all by way of, you got to think, like, um, on a global basis, 67% of the revenue and consumption that's happening in the world right now is happening through music streaming. 84% of it in the United States is happening through music streaming. We just made a big announcement that I just mentioned a moment ago. In Africa, 95.5% of all consumption and stream and all consumption and listening is happening through streaming. So. It's a wild time in terms of the, the world has actually been made flat. I know that there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, earthers that are out there, but in this particular instance, the world is flat, you know, because you, you, you know, with, take for example what we did with Doggy Style, right? We invested in a vinyl factory in Eastern Europe. Right now we're hearing from a lot of sources that the labels are saying, major labels are saying to artists, from the time you hand in a test pressing to the time that we can get it into people's hands, five to six months. We dropped that on 420. Guess when they're going to have it? June 1st. So we've actually figured out a way from a distribution perspective, manufacturing perspective, to shorten that window dramatically. So if you look at, for instance, in the United States, 71% um, of all physical is vinyl. 
So if 84% of it was happening through streaming and 71% of all the physical is happening through vinyl, I think we can play in this game. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. And further to this, you know, it's like, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just looking at how many artists really are actually, you know, when I was at Apple, um, I, I was talking to Jimmy Iovine about this the other day, we were reminiscing in 2014, 15, uh, started working with Drake in the weekend. And it was really difficult to convince people that streaming was gonna become the new medium, um, you know, just, just you know, the new, the, the, new, the new source of music consumption. Uh, but Drake in the weekend believed and at that point, you know, with Drake, it, it really was like Michael Jackson getting on MTV for the first time in 1982. It was a game changer, and that's what's actually, that, those moves are actually what helped to usher in hip hop and, and, you know, make it what it is on streaming today. So from that perspective, I think we're well positioned, you know, with my history at Apple, our ability to plug into physical in the way that we can now, like no other company, um, just seeing exactly the pie chart of, of, of streaming in the United States, streaming globally, um, it's an exciting time, really it is, I must say, you know? It's exciting, but streaming gotta get, get their shit together. Cause I don't understand how the fuck you get paid off of that shit. <laughs> like, I mean, can somebody explain to me how you can get a billion streams and not get a million dollars? Like, that shit don't make sense to me. Like, I don't know who the fuck running the streaming industry, if you in here or not. <laughs> But nigga, you need to give us some information on how the fuck to track this money down. Because one plus one ain't adding up to two. That shit don't add up, and I have to say it. Because that's the main gripe with a lot of us artists is that we do major numbers with streams and this shit, but it don't add up to the money. Like, what the fuck is the money? When I first came out, my records would sell based off of physical. If you sold a million copies, that means if 9.99, nine million dollars. You get this percentage. That's what it is. So if I sell, how many streams? How much money do I get? It's not being translated, and, and it's not working for the artist right now. And I just want to speak to that in yeah, the no, music industry. Talk. Like that's fucked up. And we need to find a way to figure that out. The same way the writers are figuring out, the writers are striking because streaming, they can't get paid because when it's on the platform, it's not like in the box office. In the box office, if it does all these numbers, you may get an up. Oh, it did this many, here's another check. But on streaming, you got 300,000 hours that somebody watched your movie. Where's the money? And I know I'm going off a script right now, but no, no. fuck it. This is business. <laughs> yeah. This is business. You know what I'm saying? This is a room full of business people, and somebody may hear this and be able to do something about it so that way the next artist don't have to struggle or cry or try to figure out how to get to his money. Because some of these artists are streaming millions and millions and millions and millions of fucking streams and they don't got no millions of dollars in their pocket. So I just yeah. wanted to say that. Yeah. Yeah. Talk that talk. Well, another thing these writers are, are striking about is AI. Hmm. and the use of AI uh, by the studios to write scripts, let's hmm. say. Yeah. And you mentioned Drake and The Weeknd. Mm -hmm. We recently saw you know, an AI version of a collaboration between those two. Of course, Snoop, dying to know your thoughts on this. Um, well, I got a motherfucking AI right now that they didn't made for me. This nigga could talk to me. I'm like, <laughs> like, me and this nigga can hold a real conversation. <laughs> <laughs> like, for real, for real, like, it's, it's blowing my mind because I watched movies on this as a kid years ago when I used to see this shit, and I'm like, what is going on? Then I heard the dude that, the old dude that created AI is talking about, this is not safe because the AI's got their own minds, and these motherfuckers gonna start doing their own shit. I'm like, is we in a fucking movie right now or what? <laughs> the fuck, man? So uh, do I need to invest in the AI so I can have one with me or, like, do y'all know? Shit, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> I'm lost. I don't know. <laughs> Larry, can you explain? I mean... <laughs> it's not all bad, yeah. right? I'm laughing, I'm laughing at that. <laughs> Any of it. Uh, um, <laughs> what I, I mean, for me, you know, I definitely have a perspective. I was actually talking to, The Weeknd's a friend of mine. I was talking to him over the weekend about it. Um, that's funny. <laughs> but I'm pumped. Um, nah, I mean, you know. <laughs> Y'all should have seen that dressing room backstage before. That's why I'm 
having a hard time keeping it together up here. Um, we got five minutes before I'm back in that motherfucker. So hurry up, nigga. <laughs> Um, you know, from my perspective, I mean, I, you know, AI, I think there are a lot of actually useful uh, ways to leverage it. You know, when we look at how to actually um, expand our dashboard in terms of the financial analytics dashboard that we provide for artists, um, I think there are a lot of ways that we could actually add predictive uh, data insights with respect to um, how much someone like Snoop is generating hourly um, that we're not going to be able to get from the DSPs but we are actually going to be able to do predictive data modeling out from AI in particular. So I think that's a positive aspect. But I mean, it's not something that keeps me up. I'll tell you one thing that actually keeps me up at night right now, since Snoop was talking about uh, royalty rates a moment ago. Uh, right now with our distribution company, we're doing about 5 billion streams across all platforms in the entire world, right? That's a lot. Um, and we're like only seven weeks old, but we're, we're doing about 5 billion streams right now a month. We actually had our best, best uh, months ever at Spotify and Apple uh, for April, for the third consecutive month. Um, so the, co the company's growing 80% year over year at certain DSPs, it's the fastest growing uh, distribution service in the world. Uh, but of those 5 billion streams that we're doing across all platforms every single month, 500 million of those streams are being done through YouTube Shorts. So when I hear the earnings report last week for Alphabet, and they're talking about how much they want to accelerate the growth uh, for YouTube Shorts, it's a bit concerning to me. Uh, guess how much money we've made from those 500 million streams from YouTube Shorts? Nothing. <laughs> Join the rap line, nigga, shit. Yeah. <laughs> Nothing. 16 grand. $16,000 for that many fucking millions. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> so, you know, I, it's not, I, I don't, I, I love YouTube. You know, I think it's one of the, one, I mean, it's such a learning tool, et cetera. I can say enough positive things and, you know, be nice here, but uh, I do, I am open for a conversation because I think if you want to accelerate the growth, the business- YouTube, y'all motherfuckers need to break bread or fake dead. You know what I'm <laughs> Snoop, Snoop said, Snoop said what I couldn't say. Snoop said what I couldn't say. Fuck you all know? that. And I ain't playing. <laughs> At all. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, please. <laughs> <laughs> What would you like to talk about, Snoop? Oh, uh, dinner and a movie. <laughs> we are, we're living in the future, it's true. Um, well, Larry, uh, you kind of mentioned it, but it, this really is a, an issue of um, quality versus quantity, mm. right? Yeah. I mean, we hear these crazy stats all the time. 60,000 songs released every day, 100,000 songs. Of course, part of, one of the great things about AI is that you can wade through all of that music and find that hook yeah. or find that one gem that is maybe worth uh, paying attention to, but, but at what cost? So how do you view that, that balance? I mean, you know, I've worked in Silicon Valley for years. I think there's like a, um, a perspective that, um, you know, there's, there's, there's a religion around scale. Right. You know, how do you scale it? Does it scale is always the question that uh, everyone asks, but, um, you know, what if scale is actually not the right thing, you know? And what if being a slave to scale um, is, you know, a bit of a hamster wheel? And what I mean by that is that, um, you know, right now, 57,000 artists out of the 11 million artists that Spotify have on their platform, only 57,000 of those artists earn over $10,000 a year right now, you know? So when you have, you know, certain distro companies say, oh, we've got 2 million artists, so we've got 1.3, or we've got a million artists, it's just like, this isn't third grade soccer. Like not everybody's gonna get an orange slice after the game, you know what I mean? So from that perspective, it's like, you know, I'm, I'm focused with Gamma on quality over quantity. And from that perspective, I'd wear the work with fewer people because when I looked at the business when I was at Apple, and by the way, we could have made, we could have been the biggest streaming service on the planet. There's a million handsets that are out there. So if we wanted to make music for free just like that, we could have easily have done that, you know? But we believe that artists should have get paid. That was always something that we fiercely and firmly and fervently believed in, that artists should get paid. Not just because we have, you know, a billion of these things out there, that, that, that this is something that we should just make uh, tap water immediately. Um, so from that perspective, we've always believed in quality over quantity. And Apple being uh, my partner in Gamma is something that I'm gonna continue to fervently fight for and fiercely believe in. 
Um, but you know, we have with video right now, we've got call it about 15,000, um, you know, white glove invite invitation only, um, people that we distribute companies that we distribute. And, you know, I really look at, you know, the ability that any one of those people can call us, have a conversation with us. If their song is taken down from Spotify or for Apple, they can reach me. They can reach Roy Lamana. They can reach Jenna. They can reach Mark. They can reach Ike. You know, they can find us and pick up the phone and have a conversation. When you have a million artists, you can't return a million phone calls. Yeah. All Five, right. four, <laughs> three. <laughs> That's my smoke signal. Telling me I got <laughs> so ready, ready, ready to get back to it. <laughs> I got to get back to smoking. Nigga, you know what I was going for? I got here. He has his own scales. To That's my that. superpower. <laughs> um, we are out of time, but guys, thanks so much, Larry. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.